Bobby Fuller made a name for himself when he and his band, the Bobby Fuller Four, signed a deal with Mustang Records in 1964. The British invasion was in full effect at the time, but the band chose to follow in the style of rock and roll legend Buddy Holly. While the band's first top 40 hit, Let Her Dance, quickly gained popularity, it was the band's second chart-topping song, I Fought the Law, which would forever become synonymous with Bobby Fuller. However, Bobby would not live long enough to enjoy the song's tremendous success and would die at age 23, just one year older than Buddy Holly had been when he died. Riding high on their success, the Bobby Fuller Four were appearing in Los Angeles clubs and on television shows, and everyone saw dollar signs when looking at them. On the morning of July 18, 1966, Bobby received a phone call and exited his apartment, driving off in his mother's blue Oldsmobile. Later in the day, Bobby was found lying in the front seat of the car. His body was soaked in gasoline, a gas can sat nearby, and his body was covered in bruises. Bobby's mother made the horrifying discovery, and it was later determined that Bobby had been dead in the car for 30 minutes before he was found. Soon, the news of Bobby's death was splashed all over television stations and speculation ran rampant that the 23-year-old had committed suicide. Despite having not interviewed anyone who knew Bobby, the Los Angeles Police Department disposed of the gas can, never dusting it or the car for fingerprints, and seemed to agree with early reports of suicide. The medical examiner later ruled Bobby's death to have been due to asphyxiation related to the gas fumes. As for the bruising, it was ruled that this was caused by the gas vapors combined with the summer heat and not the result of an assault. On the official report, the medical examiner checked both the accidental and suicide boxes. Several months later, Bobby's cause of death was changed to accidental asphyxiation, but this did little to answer the questions that lingered. Many wondered if Bobby had been murdered and the scene was then staged. Others wondered how Bobby could have reached an advanced stage of rigor mortis, which typically takes between two and six hours, if he'd only been dead for 30 minutes. Bobby's brother Randy, a member of the band, later said Bobby was planning on going solo, and he believed his brother had been murdered. A wide array of theories were suggested, including everything from connections to LSD, an insurance scam, and even that Charles Manson may have been involved. Over 50 years later, and the truth remains a mystery. William Desmond Taylor was a popular actor turned director who made a name for himself during the 1910s and 20s, directing more than 59 silent films and acting in more than 30. At the height of his fame in 1918, at age 46, Taylor enlisted in the Canadian Expeditionary Force and would go on to serve in World War I as part of the Royal Army Service Corps. He returned to Hollywood in 1919 and was honored with a formal banquet held at the Los Angeles Athletic Club. Picking up right where he left off, Taylor would go on to direct films starring rising stars such as Mary Pickford and Dustin Farnham. In 1921, Taylor's ex-wife, who had custody of their daughter, saw him in a film, Captain Alvarez, and reached out. Taylor visited the two in New York City and officially made his daughter, Ethel Daisy, his rightful and legal heir. Unfortunately, Taylor would die less than a year later under extremely mysterious circumstances. On the morning of February 2nd, 1922, at approximately 7.30 a.m., Taylor's body was discovered inside of his bungalow at the Alvarado Court Apartments, located at 404B South Alvarado Street in the Westlake area of Los Angeles. At the time, Westlake was an up-and-coming area, home to many rich and notable individuals. When Taylor's body was found, multiple people in the area crowded into the bungalow to witness the scene before police arrived. An unknown individual who claimed to be a doctor approached the body, 
examined it, and explained that Taylor had died due to a stomach hemorrhage. When investigators arrived on the scene, Taylor's body was moved, and it was discovered that he had been shot in the back with a small caliber pistol. There has been debate about whether he was shot more than once, and the details have been lost to time, but the murder weapon was never found, and the so-called doctor disappeared before investigators could speak with him. His true identity was never discovered. Investigators found $78 in Taylor's pockets, the equivalent of $1,100 today, and he was wearing a two-carat diamond ring. In addition, there was a pen knife, cigarette case, pocket watch, and a locket containing the photo of actress Mabel Normand. While this made investigators believe that robbery was not the motive, it was later discovered that Taylor had been in possession of a large sum of money, which disappeared sometime after he was murdered. Many suspects were named and speculated about, including con men and actresses, though no one was ever charged. No answers were ever found in Taylor's murder, and it remains an unsolved case today. In the 1960s, the bungalows were demolished and today, the precise location of Taylor's murder is now a parking lot near Alvarado and Maryland streets. Journalist, game show panelist, and feminine icon Dorothy Kilgallen was celebrity royalty in the 1950s and 60s. While a woman behind the typewriter, Kilgallen found herself in headlines several times, most notably when she had a feud with Frank Sinatra, showed vigorous support for Sam Shepard who had been accused of murdering his wife, and for testifying in the defense of Lenny Bruce in his trial on obscenity charges. While appearing on the television game show What's My Line, Kilgallen only increased her level of fame but it would be her friendship with a politician that would ultimately lead her to dig into one of the greatest conspiracies in American history. Following the assassination of John F. Kennedy, Kilgallen vehemently disagreed with the ruling of the Warren Commission and wrote multiple articles, including testimony from the commission, which had not been made public at the time. Kilgallen arranged an interview with Jack Ruby, the man who had shot and killed Lee Harvey Oswald, and following this, told friends and family that she was going to blow the lid off the Kennedy assassination. Unfortunately, Kilgallen would never get that opportunity. On November 8th, 1965, Kilgallen was found dead on the third floor of her Manhattan townhouse. Her death was ruled accidental and chalked up to a deadly combination of alcohol and barbiturates. At the time of her death, Dorothy's files on the Kennedy assassination disappeared, though she had given copies to a friend and fellow reporter, Florence Smith. Just two days after Kilgallen's death, Smith was also found dead in her bed, allegedly due to a mixture of alcohol and barbiturates, and much like in the case of Kilgallen, all of the notes disappeared. To this day, it's unknown whether Dorothy Kilgallen's death was truly an accident related to a toxic mixture of drugs and alcohol, or if the world-famous journalist got a little too close to uncovering the truth about what really happened in Dealey Plaza in November of 1963. If you'd like to learn more about the death of Dorothy Kilgallen, click here to listen to the full-length two-part episode. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, and share. To submit suggestions for future episodes, find social media accounts, and more, visit trace-evidence.com or click on the website link here.